welcome everybody. Um, it's a privilege to talk to you today. Um, what I have been asked to talk about is how RNA technology may be used for personalized medicine, particularly in the cancer space. Um, now, I should uh, tell you that I'm not an oncologist, um, but I work on RNA technology, particularly its design, um, and uh, very much focused on the immunology around how RNA vaccines work. Um, and those of you who heard my talk uh, 18 months ago, or perhaps a little bit longer, will know that we've been developing this technology at Imperial primarily in the infectious disease space. Um, and so we have been working on COVID vaccines, but also at a wide range of other technologies. I'm actually going to talk about that less today because I thought um, there's a lot of recent interest in how this technology can be used uh, for personalized medicine. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So my first slide is just to really remind people about uh, what RNA is um, and how it works. So when we think about a normal cell, um, your DNA, which makes up your chromosomes, and essentially is the blueprint for making any protein that a cell may need, sits in the nucleus. And when that cell wants to make a protein, the protein is transcribed into messenger RNA, which is the cousin of DNA, but it's single-stranded moves from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And one of the aspects of RNA is that it is relatively unstable. So in order to continuously make a protein, you need to continue to make the RNA, which allows a very precise controlling of the amount of protein that make, that's made, because as soon as you stop making that particular message, um, the protein is no longer manufactured. And the protein is manufactured by what we call ribosomes. These look at the message um, and the codons, that, which are made from three nucleotides, and matches up um, and joins together the amino acids that go on to make that protein. So when we think about RNA technology, what we're doing is actually introducing RNA into host cells and bypassing this DNA step. And that has the advantage in that it's uh, transitory, um, it doesn't alter the genome, and so its uh, potential for making any genetic changes is essentially uh, non-existent. And that's quite important for public perception because people are still uh, slightly anxious about uh, things that might change your genes. Um, and so this is not gene therapy. This is using RNA to encode proteins to elicit either a vaccine response or to replace proteins um, in individuals where those proteins might be missing. And the technology actually has been developed um, over the last at least 20 years um, and probably longer. Now, there are two types of therapeutic RNA that are widely being used. One is uh, conventional RNA, which is essentially looking very much at that messenger RNA, the same type of uh, structure that the cell produces, manufacturing it. Uh, externally. And then because the RNA is very fragile, it needs to be essentially delivered in small, very sophisticated, um, what we call lipid nanoparticles, which are uh, uh, nanometer size lipid droplets. So about the size of a virus. And these protect the RNA. Um, when it's injected into the body and are readily taken into cells, this releases the RNA cargo, and then whatever that RNA is encoding is expressed as a protein, um, either uh, on the surface or secreted from the cells, 
but also, as I will go into in a little bit more, presented as peptides. Um, and this is important for engaging the cellular responses. We at Imperial also work on what's called self-amplifying RNA. This is um, a, a sort of next generation approach where it also encodes genes that can amplify the RNA within a cell. And that um, accelerates the protein production and can uh, give a, a more pronounced immune response, particularly the cellular immune response. And so that provides some benefit for infectious disease vaccines, but also for uh, vaccines against tumors. The really nice uh, aspect of this technology is that it's relatively fast to produce. Um, here we can go from the sequence of a virus, but this could also be the sequence of a tumor, to designing your vaccine and producing it in a very small scale facility, purifying the RNA, formulating it, and filling it into vials in, in a matter of days. Now, this is really useful in, in a pandemic setting because it means you could make a vaccine very quickly. But in the context of thinking about uh, personalized cancer vaccines, it can also be done on a relatively small scale. So we are uh, in the process of building a facility that can make this for clinical use at Imperial. And that facility will be will have the footprint of uh, the same size as two shipping containers. So you can see it can be a small facility. And ultimately, in the future, I think that this type of approach may be uh, built alongside most high tech hospitals of the future. This means that rather than having to have a very large manufacturing facility, you can make small uh, aliquots of vaccines for individual patients. How does it work? Well, once it's been manufactured and formulated, put into the vial um, and shipped to the clinical setting, essentially it's injected most often into the muscle. Um, where it's then expressed, the proteins are manufactured by the cells themselves, and they can then induce an immune response that hopefully has a therapeutic effect. So when we think about uh, tumors, tumors are not the same as infectious disease pathogens. Essentially, when you have a normal cell, that normal cell is always making proteins, and some of those proteins are disassembled within that cell and expressed on what we call MHC uh, molecules. And this is a way that cells use to present their own self antigens to the immune system to say that essentially they are only making what is part of you. But in the context of a tumor, you uh, may have a mutation either in the DNA or a change in your RNA that means one or more of those amino acids, but most often it may be a single amino acid, is changed from the normal sequence. And when that's changed, if it uh, looks sufficiently different, when it's presented on the surface, it can be recognized by the immune system. And it's thought that a lot of cancerous cells are routinely deleted by your immune system. And that's why uh, people who are immunosuppressed um, will often be much more prone to developing tumors because those tumors would normally uh, have been deleted by the immune system. However, more aggressive tumors uh, may go unrecognized by the immune system, and that's when a, a tumor may actually grow and uh, essentially grow without control. 
So when we think of this pathway of showing self antigens and trying to recognize foreign antigens, what uh, I hope I'm articulating is that healthy cells are always expressing their own self antigens. Your immune system is seeing those and saying, that's all fine. I've seen those before, that's part of you. I don't need to make an immune response. If you have an infection with a bacteria or a virus, of course, all those proteins look completely different. And so your immune system is, is primed to recognize what we call our non-self antigens. And then you get elicit an immune response, and that can lead to the deletion of viral or bacterially infected cells. Now, it's a little bit more complex in the uh, case of cancerous cells. Some cancerous cells, in fact, are just making the same, same types of proteins as normal cells, but in a, a higher level of abundance. So in this context, these are very difficult to target by the immune system. However, specific cancer cells may make those mutations, um, and those mutations have the potential to be recognized by the immune system. When we think about this in the context of tumor antigens, there are two main approaches that people are focusing on. The first is trying to recognize what we call shared neoantigens, so new antigens that are common across different cancer patients um, and not present in your normal genome, in your normal DNA. Um, these are really uh, the most useful because where they can be identified, they would allow one to, uh, to develop a pan-cancer uh, vaccine. So, for example, a lot of work is going ahead in the context of identifying common mutations that might be associated, for example, with prostate cancer in order to develop a pan-prostate cancer vaccine. However, these are rare um, and quite hard to target. And most cancers actually express neoantigens that are completely different from patient to patient. And this is why people have been very uh, interested and excited about being able to develop personalized neoantigen targeting vaccines. In the past, this has been difficult to do because the technology has not been there to develop personalized vaccines fast enough in order to have clinical utility. And it's the advent of RNA technology, the ability to make things at speed and at small scale, that's now allowing this field to uh, take off and be accelerated. So how do you identify these uh, neoantigens? Well, it is a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Essentially, it requires uh, a sample of the tumor to be excised, um, and then for whole genome sequencing, both of the DNA and often of the RNA, and then using very uh, clever and extensive algorithms to look at what's expressed in the tumor relative to normal cells and try and pull out the differences between the two. Often these differences can be very small, and you can see here a single change in the genetic code is identifying a neoantigen that's only expressed in the tumor and not in your healthy cells. Now, of course, it's important to identify those differences because you don't want to elicit an immune response that is going to start to attack normal healthy cells, or essentially you're setting up an autoimmune response. But just to emphasize that actually this, this single point mutation um, will still not be a strong uh, activator of the immune system. Um, and if you put that in the context of an invading virus, essentially the invading virus's genetic code 
will be completely different um, to your own uh, genetic code. And so this uh, is a much stronger flag to the immune system to say, make an immune response and delete any cell that is actually expressing this virus. So while we can identify these mutations, the ability to activate the immune system against these mutations is still uh, a significant challenge. So what then is done with these mutations is they are analyzed in order to look at their potential to be used as a vaccine. So the first thing that these algorithms look at is to say, well, are these mutations in a section of the DNA that actually encodes for a protein? So I'm sure you're aware that uh, a lot of your uh, DNA actually is redundant and it's not encoding for protein, it's, it's just silent DNA. So the first thing is to look for, is it part of a protein? Um, and then to assess whether that mutation actually leads to a change in the protein itself. Because you can have changes in the DNA that still code for uh, the same protein. And essentially, the algorithm is looking to see whether it's encoding for a mutated protein. And then the third level is to say, well, how likely is it that the immune system is going to be able to recognize that check? <clears throat> and so uh, these very extensive algorithms are trying to come up with neoantigens that fit uh, these three criteria. Um, and depending on the individual and the type of tumor that they have, there may be more or less of these. But because these are still very like your own proteins, uh, most of these vaccine approaches also require us to uh, take the breaks off the immune response. So T cells, particularly killer T cells, um, are very carefully controlled to ensure that you're still not recognizing your own cellular proteins. Because obviously you don't want that to happen routinely. Um, to prevent having autoimmune uh, responses to your own cells. And so there are a lot of what we call checkpoints, uh, which are cellular molecules. This is only one of them, uh, PD-1, um, that essentially is trying to limit the reactivity of cells that are recognizing your own proteins. Um, and because the mutated proteins may only differ by uh, a single amino acid. In order to wake up these cells, the vaccines are often delivered together with these, with what we call checkpoint inhibitors that essentially take the breaks off the immune system and allow the uh, T cells to then respond against things that are slightly different from self, but not. Uh, as far in terms of difference as bacterial or viral pathogens that might have invaded those cells. So RNA technology helps because of the speed. Um, it can be done in a, in a matter of days in order to release the antigens, the vaccines, and get them into clinical practice. And again, this may be uh, of real importance because the earlier a tumor is recognized, um, sequenced, and the vaccine is made, the more likelihood that the vaccine will be able to delete the uh, limited uh, number of cells that may be mutated and uh, causing a tumor or once the tumor has been excised. And we certainly know already with this technology that the larger the tumor is, at the time a vaccine is then administered, um, the less effective the vaccine would be. So as this technology matures, diagnosis, early diagnosis, and then uh, putting 
these technologies together to identify those neoantigens and then get back to the patient and vaccinate them as soon as possible, the uh, more effective this type of approach will be. So what I hope I've really uh, shown to you is the, the process of making a personalized vaccine. It goes from excising the tumor, comparing the tumor DNA um, and RNA to normal tissue, doing uh, a, a lot of bioinformatics in order to understand where those mutations are and whether those mutations are leading to the production of, uh, of aberrant proteins, and then seeing if they can be expressed in these surface uh, receptors on the cells that allow them to be recognized by the immune system. And if they are, manufacturing them as an RNA vaccine as fast as possible that can then be used to vaccinate the patient. So when the RNA is then used to vaccinate a patient, it's taken up by uh, cells that then express the protein within the cell and the protein is then processed to be loaded onto these MHC class one and class two uh, receptors that present the peptides um, related to the tumor to the T cells, whether they're, whether they're what we call CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. Um, CD8 T cells being the cells that can kill and recognize tumors. And so what one is doing with the vaccine is really loading up cells in the context of checkpoint inhibitors um, and activators of the immune system to accelerate the body's ability to generate T cells that could recognize that tumor. Um, so aggressively, you're trying to maximize the chances of the immune system raising a cellular response against the tumor so that it can then go back and eliminate cells that are expressing those mutated proteins. So the big question is, does it work? Um, and the answer is yes, but it's still very early days. Um, the number of, number of studies looking at personalized uh, vaccines in this space are still relatively small and relatively early. But this uh, is one that I would like to walk you through, just a few um, snippets of how it can work. Um, so this is a paper very recently published in Nature. Um, it came out uh, in May, and it's looking at personalized RNA neoantigen vaccines uh, against uh, pancreatic cancer. And for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with pancreatic cancer, it is a very nasty cancer. Um, it has a very high mortality rate. So with uh, best practice, which is removing the pancreas and uh, giving chemotherapy, nearly 80% of those patients will have recurrence of disease within 40 months, and their overall five-year survival rate is, is less than 30%. So you can see that this is a very big challenge um, in order to develop a personalized vaccine that might have uh, success in this space. Um, and of course, in this context, because the patients are having the tumor excised as early as possible, what you're trying to do with a vaccine is generate an immune response that is going to be active at preventing disease recurrence rather than eliminating the existing tumor. So how successful was this and what did it look like? Well, this is a, a, a nice, slide showing the approach um, of, again, taking the tumor, looking for tumor-specific antigens, using these very uh, 
clever algorithms to identify those antigens, or those new antigens, and then manufacturing the RNA vaccine. So this was a small trial. They originally recruited 32 subjects. Um, they all had to have their uh, tumor uh, had to have been resected with uh, no uh, borderline unresectable material, no advanced or metastatic disease, um, and no other neoantigen therapy. And in order to be in the trial, this uh, extensive algorithm had to identify at least five or more neoantigens from the tumor. So that meant that going from an initial 32 subjects, um, they were only able to identify 16 subjects that had five or more neoantigens. The approach of treating these uh, individuals was uh, relatively aggressive in that they had surgery. They then had one of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors, an antibody that essentially blocks what we call PDL1, that is taking the brakes off the immune system. And then you can see that they get uh, a number of priming doses of the vaccine. So uh, many of you will have had RNA vaccines, um, and uh, some of you will have felt a bit rough after an RNA vaccine, um, and you're only getting maybe a booster uh, once or twice a year. These individuals are getting a large number of shots over a very short time period. They then go on to standard chemotherapy and then have a booster uh, towards the end of the approach. So what did they see in this study? Well, they saw that um, eight of the 16 individuals responded to their vaccines. Um, so a, a good start, but this is not a therapy that is 100% effective. So if you were using a vaccine against COVID, you would expect to see 100% of individuals responding to that vaccine with a single shot. What you can see here is after multiple shots, uh, half the individuals are responding to the vaccine, half of them are not. And what I think that really highlights is that these neoantigens are very immunosuppressive. They are not dominant antigens. You are having to push the immune system very hard to raise a response. Of those eight individuals that responded, shown here, 50% of them had responses against several of their neoantigens, and 50% only saw a single neoantigen. So uh, good responses, but still uh, relatively uh, small responses. Did it have an impact? Well, this is the good news in that those individuals who responded, shown in red here, over a period of uh, 30 months uh, did extremely well. Whereas those that did not respond did uh, much less well. So you can see that uh, in terms of the responders um, and the non-responders, you can see uh, the relative risk of recurrence of disease. And again, this is a nice uh, illustration of one individual who uh, before surgery uh, was fine. This is looking at the liver. After surgery, uh, they started to see a new uh, suspicious liver lesion, but after the vaccination, that was completely clear. So not a magic bullet, but really a very encouraging first start in showing for uh, a very aggressive tumor that vaccination in those individuals who responded um, had a very good outcome. Now, of course, the challenge now is to be able to work out why some individuals responded, why some individuals did not respond, and try and convert uh, more of those individuals into responders with uh, new technology in the future. 
Now, one of the things that I think is very much going to help with this technology um, and one of the uh, benefits of uh, technology that has been widely uh, and quite in a quite alarming way um, raised some caution is the advent of uh, artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence, one of the pos positive things of artificial intelligence is it will get better and better at trying to understand uh, what neoantigens are good neoantigens and how they can be targeted. So this technology, I think, will accelerate in the future um, and will become more and more beneficial in the oncology space. The note of caution is these are still very small trials. Um, and whenever people start talking about these, um, people imagine that they can all, if they develop a cancer, start to have personalized medicine today. We are not there yet. Um, it is something that hopefully will come in the coming years, um, but it will take a time before it's widely used and widely successful. So currently it's bringing new technology and new tools to conventional cancer therapy, um, and it is of, uh, of great promise. And of course, um, this technology can be used for a wide range of other uh, diseases, um, whether it's uh, cancer therapies, whether it's infectious disease, whether it's in allergy spaces or for rare diseases. So the technology has arrived. It's still in a, uh, the, a relatively early stage of development, but I suspect over the coming years, we will see it being used more and more widely. And I will stop there. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and look for the questions. Alan, I think you're on mute. There, there we are. I think I found the button. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Great. OK, thank you. Robin, that was that was terrific. Um, quite a lot to take in. Not 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 helped by the the the, the relatively uh, uh, for a layman, difficult you know non medical person, the difficult uh, vo vocabulary and so on. But you, you've done a brilliant job in uh, explaining it um, at a at a, 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 a a slow rate to help our um, comprehension of it. Um, if, if people would like to type in some questions, we've got a, we've got a few. Uh, ah, they're growing rapidly, right? Um, I, I, I will start to try and address the, the question. So the, right. the first question is, um, so will patients often have multiple different uh, neoantigens? Um, so you can see from the example that I presented, yeah. they were only able to find 50% of their subjects who had uh, multiple neoantigens. Now, that may be that the technology is not good enough at recognizing neoantigens, or it may be that, that, that actually there will always be some individuals where neoantigens are just not expressed. The next question is, do different cancers have significantly different mutation rates? Um, I'm not an expert, but yes, for certain, uh, I'm sure that different cancers will have different mutation rates and mm. different levels of neoantigens. Mm. So this technology will be more successful against certain types of cancers than others. Mm. Mm. Um, then another question is, has there been any consideration as yet as to how the mRNA procedure would function concurrently with radiotherapy? Um, as this has DNA as a target. So um, all of these technologies are being used alongside uh, uh, standard uh, practices. So they're not being used without standard practices. So they would be used to see if they can enhance standard practice, including radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, then another question. Uh, how can we test oops, I'll just how can we test individual vaccines for both efficacy and safety with particular focus on safety? That's a really interesting question. 
Um, and, and safety is always of paramount importance. Mm. What uh, people are thinking, and certainly the regulators think of, is that the RNA technology is a platform technology. So there is an increasing safety dossier around RNA in general and the formulation that is delivered in. Now, that is not the same as safety around particular neoantigens. Now, obviously, it's important to uh, bear in mind that the risk benefit um, calculation for somebody with terminal cancer is very different than the risk benefit ratio for somebody that you're giving a preventative vaccine to in the context of an infectious disease. Mm. So the, 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 you know, the safety balance is quite different there. And that's not to say that people are doing something that's unsafe. But if you, uh, if I draw a, an extreme example, or two extreme examples, obviously in the context of a preventative vaccine, it has to be extremely safe. In the context of a life-limiting uh, cancer treatment, in the first instance, one is obviously looking to see whether you can cure or uh, allow those individuals to go into remission. And actually thinking about the safety of that vaccine over a multi-year period would be a very nice position to be in. But often one is prolonging life for a, a period of months or years, um, and therefore long-term safety is uh, less of the focus rather than acute safety. I'm not sure if I've done justice to that question, but safety is important. Um, next question, mm -hmm. do we know how much protein will be produced in any individual? Uh, with traditional protein or whole pathogen vaccines, the amount produced is known with tolerances. But with RNA, how well is the variability of protein production across individuals? That's a really nice question as well. Um, and uh, we, we don't know entirely how that will vary between individual to individual. Um, but the amount of protein that's being made in the context of a vaccine is still uh, relatively small. Um, and so those variances, um, certainly in the context of COVID vaccines, um, although those variances likely exist, we see that all individuals respond and have a similar safety profile. That may be uh, much more difficult to assess for neoantigens um, because one is not measuring the amount of protein that's being expressed, but the immune response to those neoantigens. Mm -hmm. um, next question, do you think that mRNA vaccines may be applicable for avian flu? Absolutely. Um, we are looking at that. Many other people are looking at that. The advantage of RNA technology is we don't exactly know what avian flu will look like in terms of the changes that may need to be made for it to become uh, pathogenic and transmissible from human to human. The advantage of the RNA technology is as soon as that, uh, well, if that does happen, one would be able to uh, look at that sequence and make it as an RNA vaccine uh, relatively quickly compared to other types of uh, vaccine technology. Mm -hmm. Then the, the last question, and the next question I can see um, is, are the lipid nanoparticles targeting antigen presenting cells with neoantigens already present and essentially upregulating membrane expression? Or is it non-specific in targeting somatic uh, cells? That's another lovely question. Um, yes, uh, they, we are trying to target them to antigen-presenting cells. Um, 
we ne certainly know that if it's injected into the muscle, um, some of those uh, lipid nanoparticles get to uh, what we call the draining lymph node um, and target those antigen presenting cells. But there's probably, um, again, a lot more work that can be done to uh, make that targeting even more precise um, and make the vaccines more potent. Uh, then another question, uh, for a cancer that doesn't produce a tumor, e.g. blood cancers, is there an alternative to comparing tumor cells with normal cells? Okay, so um, there I'm probably talking a little bit out of my comfort zone, um, but blood cancer cells, again, do have markers on them, which may uh, be similar to other cells, but are expressed at higher levels. So certainly we have antibodies, for example, that have been useful in blood cancer therapies. Um, those could be uh, encoded by RNA vaccines or RNA vaccines might work in that space. But I probably don't have the expertise to give a really good answer to that. Hmm. Um, can this technology be used for animal vaccine production? Yes, um, we're already working with a, a couple of animal uh, vaccine uh, companies to look and see whether it can work in that space. One of the challenges there at the moment is these are still relatively expensive vaccines. Animal, animal vaccines usually have to cost pennies and getting the cost of goods down to make them commercially viable mm -hmm. is a challenge right now, but hopefully something that can be solved in the future. Um, and then the next question is, can we use computational chemistry biology to predict the specifics of the immune response uh, and then uh, particularly evaluate the safety and efficacy? Um, short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is it, it's complicated. Um, and again, I think things like uh, artificial intelligence is gonna make that uh, better and better. So that's one of the potential benefits of artificial intelligence um, and you know, computer technology in general, things like machine learning. Mm. Uh, and that seems, I think, to have exhausted the questions. Right. Uh, am I still unmuted? I, th I think you I are. Have. Robin, that was, that was terrific. Thank you. C can I add an, another question verbally, if I may? Um, is, is there any reason to suppose in advance that some types of cancer may not be amenable to the type of approach you've been describing using mRNA? So, I, I mean, I'm... Again, I'm not an expert oncologist, but I'm sure that there will be cancers that are harder to be to be tackled by this technology. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that I have not touched upon is, of course, you can erase an immune response against tumors, but tumors themselves can be very uh, resistant to their elimination. Yeah. One of the reasons that they can be resistant to, to elimination is that actually things like the T cells that can can actually eliminate those tumors can't access or gain entry into the tumor itself in order to be able to uh, target them effectively. So this oh, is the why tumor mass. the tumor mass. This is why you know it's not a magic bullet. Mm. It's a technology again that that adds to the armory that we already have. Mm. Um, and so there are some things where it may work extremely well. Mm. There are some things that there will be additional challenges that need to be overcome in order to be able to get the best out of this technology. Yes, yes. And, and I've, I've, I've taken the point along, along the way, I hope correctly, that uh, when it comes to designing um, mRNA treatments in the future potentially to treat individual patients, each with an individual cancer, which has been sequenced, um, then that's a different kettle of fish, I, I imagine, markedly from uh, the sort of situation we had with COVID, where the object was to produce hundreds of litres of, yeah. of vaccines all to go into millions of arms, but the same, the same vaccine. 
Yes, so they're, they're, they're two polar opposites. One, you're making the same thing, mm -hmm. but masses of it. Yeah. Um, and one of the challenges in COVID is this technology had never been made um, at a global scale. Mm -hmm. So although there was a lot of criticism about uh, access to RNA vaccines, mm -hmm. before COVID, the, the infrastructure did not exist to mm -hmm. make billions of doses. Um, it is there now, but it can also be made on a very small scale. So you can make in you know the the, the size of a of a, a test tube um, enough vaccine for probably a hundred individuals. So mm. in a very small tube, you can make enough vaccine for one individual, and that brings the cost down and makes it really very amenable to this individualized uh, approach. Yes, I, I had the, the 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 sort of mental image of. Um, the, 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 the fact that preparing mRNA vaccine for, uh, for an individual patient and their individual cancer in the future sounds as if, uh, you, you know, we've bypassed one difficult step of making the thing in large vats and in hundreds of litres quantities, but we've got the problem of having to um, uh, do a biopsy on the patient uh, i.e. the patient's already presenting with a cancer um, rather than a completely preventive treatment. And in addition, we've got the, 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 the issue of then having to take a biopsy, sequence it, decide if it's cancerous and if it's an identifiable um, um, entity that can be treated and then preparing the dose and so on. And all of that's yeah. going to take individual expertise by expert pairs of hands to, to, to carry out. Yes, that's a very good um, assumption. So what what the piece that we have now is the, the ability to make the vaccine itself quickly. Mm. The, the challenges are still diagnosis, you know, diagnosing tumors very early. Um, that's mm. that's challenging. Mm. Um, then identifying those new antigens. I think that will get better and better um, with, you know, things like AI and other machine learning approaches. Um, and then having made it, it doesn't mean it's going to work um, in terms of you've got to wake up the immune system um, to yeah. recognize those. And you also have to, you know, working alongside conventional treatment, um, make sure that they can actually eliminate the tumor. So, mm -hmm. This is why it is very exciting technology. It is game changing, mm. but it doesn't mean that cancer is it is cured and it's and job done. It's it's a new tool, um, and hopefully it will make things better. Yes, but but a, but a sharp potentially a sharp spear, which if pointed and delivered in the right direction, could could be as as you've just said a, a game changer, and and capable potentially of being expanded. Uh, greatly as as indeed the COVID delivery of vaccines was, but although not quite in the same in the same way, with more detailed work in each individual patient's case. Absolutely. Right. Have we run out of um, typed questions, or has anyone added any? I don't see any more questions. So, um, Robin, that was an absolutely super talk. Thank you so much. And I'm now going to ask everyone to unmute individually if they can because I can't see a box that lets me do it. So if, if folks would like to unmute, I'd like to thank Robin very much for, for an excellent talk, which he's given at pretty short notice of, of a couple of weeks or so. And um, I'm sure one that we've all greatly enjoyed, if that's entirely the right word, but, but very helpful in very rapidly changing technology. And we're most grateful to you, Robin. Thank you so much. And perhaps everyone would like to join me in thanking Robin in the usual way. Lots of applause. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Very good.